shall start our webinar for today. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good morning, everyone. Welcome to SMI webinar, Understanding Animal Model and Animal Handling in Life Science Research this morning. This webinar is organized by Rumah Haiwan, Calibration and Facilities Unit, Secretariat for Laboratory and Instrument SMI in Faculty of Science and Technology, University Kebangsaan Malaysia. The participants, please pay attention to some of the housekeeping rules for this webinar as follows. Please mute your audio during the webinar. And if you have any question for the speaker, feel free to post your question in the chat box at any time of the webinar and Dr. Raymond will try to respond during the Q&A session at the end. The link for attendance registration will be provided in the chat box towards the end of the webinar. By completing the registration form, participants will receive digital certificate via your email. And for participants who are UKM staff, your attendance will be recorded in Uzbakat as well. All right, before we start the webinar, please let me share a brief introduction of our speaker today, Dr. Raymond. Dr. Raymond Leong Let Moon obtained his bachelor degree in biomedical science with honors from University Kebangsaan Malaysia, UKM. Over the past five years, he has deeply involved in various research projects on natural product discovery, toxicity assessment, and molecular biology in a leading toxicology research lab in UKM. His PhD study focused on molecular mechanism of novel herbal formulation on colorectal cancer. To date, he has authored and co-authored seven publications in index journals, locally and internationally. Currently, he is a project manager and technical specialist in Prima Nexus and Jan Berhad, providing technical support in molecular biology and animal-related research. Without further ado, we are pleased to invite Dr. Raymond to start the SMI webinar with his talk entitled, Understanding Animal Model and Animal Handling in Life Science Research. Over to you, Dr. Raymond. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for the very, very warm invitation as well as uh, introduction. Yeah. So uh, before I start, I would like to extend my uh, appreciation to Ruma Haiwan as well as uh, FST for us to uh, share a little bit uh, on uh, our thoughts as well as uh, some uh, knowledge uh, on animal models as well as animal handling in life science research. Yeah. So uh, this particular topic, uh, we are going to cover on how to ethically handle animals as well as uh, managing their welfare as a caretaker, as well as a researcher. Yeah. So uh, before I start, I would always like to share. Uh, hold on. Yeah. Uh, before I start, I always like to start my presentations uh, with some of the uh, pre-wording. Yeah. So. Have you, have, have, have you ever uh, typed in happy animal in your uh, Google search? Yeah, so if I type in happy animal in my Google search, these are the top 10 search uh, results that comes out. Uh. They are all very cute, right? So yeah, we can see all happy face over here, uh, smiling. They look really healthy, yeah, and very, very much pleasing. So for life science research, uh, we are often... Uh, involved in one part of the research known as in vivo, in vivo testing, where in vivo testing, uh, we use animals to explore some of the hypothetical questions that we have in mind. So mostly, uh, and most of the case, uh, we need to study either the toxicity of uh, certain products or certain uh, new development, new drugs and stuff like that uh, before we actually introduce into human. So. A part of that also, uh, animals is also used uh, to study efficacy of those products or uh, new interventions that we have. So uh, this particular process uh, by far is inevitable because before going into a, a clinical trial, we have to prove stuff in preclinical uh, setting first. So those data is deemed very, very useful. Uh, but at the same time, uh, as a caretaker of animals, we also have to take care of their welfare. And that's why 
we have to also ensure that uh, mentally uh, we take care of the animals, a part of their physical uh, supports and stuff like that. So yeah, I would like to start with the quote of happy animals is healthy animals. So yeah. I'm a big fan of a uh, movie. I really like to watch movie. And yeah, uh, one of the series that I really like is Planets of the Apes. Yeah, so Planets of the Apes is actually a long series uh, that comes out with uh, three, three series in total. So yeah, as you can see, basically in uh, the first episode, uh, we have apes, okay? So apes are uh, some sort like genetically modified, okay? And yeah, as a result, you can see that they are not happy. See, no tea, nothing, bringing gun, riding horse, all looks very angry. Yeah, so uh, not very well, not very welcoming. So uh, this might not, be the, might not be the final consequences that we want, yeah. So because they are consistently not happy, as a result, we will have the second episode as well as the third episode. So Planets of the Apes actually score pretty high in IMDb. So yeah, anyone that haven't watched it, uh, go and watch it, yeah. So, uh, and how about, let's say for example, in real life, in real life research. So is there any, any regulations uh, not to mention worldwide, we mentioned locally in Malaysia, is there any regulation to regulate uh, the usage of uh, laboratory animals or the caring of la uh, laboratory animals uh, in labs? Yes, there is. The Malaysian Animal Welfare Act 2015. This act is to make life better for animals. And it is mentioned under animal testing that all research testing and teaching you using animals must be done with a license or performed by school or university only. The animal must be well taken care of, even when pain and suffering cannot be avoided, it must be minimized or will face consequences. Yeah, so under this act, uh, it is clearly shown that we have to, as a caretaker of the animals, as well as a researcher, sometimes uh, both of these, uh, both of these position is conflicting, but we have to find a balance between both. As a researcher, the data value the most because the data contribute to answering our hypothetical questions. And at the same time, uh, for animals, we have to also take care of them uh, during the trials. And at the same time, uh, govern ourselves to provide what deemed to be best for them uh, during the trial as well. So unless we would like uh, to have our animals like our bright side, no tea, not smiling, gunpowder around, nope, I would rather prefer to have some tea with a smiling place at the lab. Yeah, so that's rational to say. Yeah, so, Drive back to which drive me to today's topic, which is also known as enrichment program. So enrichment program is a kind of program that you can actually apply to your animals as a caretaker, as well as a researcher, implement it in your colony uh, to take care of your animals. Uh, it is sort of like returning some of the control of the life of your animals. We just take one of the examples. Uh, for mice, rodents, mice and rats, okay? In a general environment, we are providing them uh, with basic care needs, for example, food, drink, and shelters. So a part of that, is there any other supplementary uh, programs that we provide to them so that they can actually spend the rest of their daily life uh, in a normal way? So, Enrichment program aims to return back that control and return back that life to the animals. But first, we have to understand the animals. And to do that, let's look into some of the common animal models for research. As one of the regional importers in, uh, for animal models in Malaysia, uh, we compile a few models that we are very commonly importing in. 
First, we have mouse. Second, immunocompromised mouse, rat, rabbit, hamster, as well as guinea pig. These are some of the common animal models for research in Malaysia. Notice all of their size is pretty small. So the biggest perhaps is rabbit. Okay, this is of course uh, to aid us in handling them. We don't want animal model that is big. First, uh, it's because of the storage, okay? Second is the, the handling can be deemed difficult. Okay, let's look into rat. What are the different types of rats that uh, researchers use? Okay, the first one, very famous one is sprout dowry rats. This is outbred rats, okay, which is ideal as a general multipurpose model. I would say is one of the very, very common model that I see in uh, a lot of works. Uh, people use it to study safety, to study efficacy, and some use it for diet-induced obesity. If, they, if you give them high-fat diet, they are very responsive to it. We start at, if you mix both of them together, SD red and we start red, you probably cannot separate them. Okay, some say that we start is smaller, but for me, I, I, I can't really recognize which one is which because both of them looks very much alike. Yeah, so we start red is also a very uh, common model, uh, general multi-purpose models. And uh, to my understanding, some people use it for aging, aging model, as well as infectious disease research. Spontaneous hypertensive rats, or also known as SHR rat. So these rats are genetically, will genetically develop hypertension at uh, the, uh, I would say, early, early age. Yeah. So, yeah, so they are ideal for hypertensive drug research as well as uh, hyperactive disease model. And if you are using SHR rats, then you have to find another control of it which is uh, their background strain, what we know as the background strain, which is the Vista Kyoto rat. So this rat will have a normal uh, blood pressure ratio to uh, the one just, just now for uh, uh, spontaneous, spontaneous hypertensive rat model. So GK rat, GK rat is also known as Koto Kakizaki rat. So these are the rat that genetically will develop non-obese type 2 diabetes. They will, uh, they will express mild uh, high, group, high blood glucose, insulin resistant, as well as uh, developing some of the uh, complication for diabetes. So some group use this uh, to study type 2 diabetes. For mouse, we have ICR mouse, which is a very, very common outbreak model as well as Bapsi mice. I would say for mice, uh, a lot of research group actually goes for Bapsi mice because Bapsi mice is an inbred mice model. So for inbred mice model, they are genetically, their genetic content is very, very similar. They are bred in a cousin, cousin uh, background. So they will have similar uh, genetic background. Uh, they are ideal as a general multipurpose model as far as for some hybridoma development and monoclonal antibody productions. C57 black 6. So black 6 mouse, un unlike the conventional thinking uh, of uh, maybe non-lab people that perhaps think that uh, lab rat or lab mice must be white in colors, uh, this defies all of them because uh, they actually come with a black coat. So, uh, C57 is also known as black 6. Uh, they are generally used in a lot of models which uh, they are transgenic and uh, their gene is knocked down to develop some uh, spe specific disease models. C3H. C3H is uh, one kind of model where they have a color code of agouti, some, uh, a fur brown in color. So, uh, we seldom import C3, uh, C3H, C3 but one of the customers that we do so is working on hair development, so hair growth. Immunodeficiency models. Uh, immunodeficiency models is used generally in cancer study as well as stem cell study. So uh, 
in the market, they are generally a line of uh, different kind of uh, uh, immunodeficiency model, depend on the severity of their immunodeficiency. So why do we need immunodeficiencies for cancer study? Uh, as we know, in, in most of time, in one field of uh, cancer study, it involves uh, xenografting, means implanting a tissue or uh, a tissue that is originated from humans or tissue cell cultures into a mice. So we don't want the mice uh, immune cell to attack the, the tissues that belongs to a human because they are going to recognize it. That's why a model that is lacking in immune cell is going to be ideal because uh, chances of rejection is going to be low and we got to see lesser background effect from that. So NCR new mouse is uh, one of the very common model. They are uh, one of the earliest model as well. And uh, they are known as new mouse because they do not have coat, which means that they do not have fur. They are also known as hairless. Uh, mouse, okay, and of course we are using it not because they are new. We are using it because uh, this mouse has some uh, gene genetic background which will develop abnormal thymus, and with such they will have defective T cell functions, which allow this mouse to accept and grow xenograft as well as allograft. Doctor Raymond, sorry to interrupt. There's yes, a request yes. from participant for you to open your mask if it's okay oh. with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fine. Right? It's, okay. Is Thank this you very better? Much, Dr. Is this better now? Yeah, for me. <laughs> oh, okay, sure. Right. So yes, for NCR nude mouse, uh, most of the time, uh, they not most of the time, sorry. For NCR nude mouse, they will have an abnormal timers, which has lacking in T cell functions. So for NU NU mouse, also known as Bapsi NU mice, uh, Bapsi NU NU, they are a mice that has a background of Bapsi. So they are also hairless. And for NU NU mouse, they are a thymic mouse, meaning that they do not have thymus. So that would remove a certain category of uh, uh, the T cells away from, from it also very much ideal for tumor biology and xenograft research. Abscinute, as well as uh, NOD mice. So for NOD, NOD is actually known as non-obese diabetic. So this animal model is a type 1 diabetic from genetic background. This is not an immunodeficient, but a slight modification of NOD will pro produce NOD skid, also known as skid mouse. This is an inbred model that is second most immunodeficient models. They do not have T cell, B cell, and a reduced function of NK cell. It comes from an NOD mouse strain, where the skit stands for severe combined immunodeficiency. So under these circumstances, they can actually support human hematopoietic stem cell engraftment. And last but not least is NGS mouse. So NGS mouse is uh, also known as not skid gamma. This is the most immunodeficient uh, model uh, by far. They are lacking in T cell, B cell, as, as well as NK cell. So it is ideal for humanized model for cancer, such as PDX model, and uh, support, support most of the xenograft uh, works. So, if you do a comparison, we will find out that for different uh, for different kind of uh, immune cell, uh, these are the differences of them. So, subjected to your work and your extent, uh, you can most of the research they will choose the appropriate one. Yeah. So now that we have understand uh, from that angle that. Uh, those are the common models that uh, we use. Now let's look back into specifically mice and rats. Okay, so to understand mice and rats as our laboratory animals, first we have to look into their physiological needs. Okay, so as a general caretaker, we will take care of their feed, their drink, as well as provide a space for them to live. Those are 
physiological needs. For example, this tree, food, drink, as well as beddings. So we provide them with basic diets, such as maintenance diets. They are normally hard by nature, okay, to support grindings, helping in their teeth. Standard beddings, these kind of beddings uh, has absorbance uh, potentials. They will have a bottom-up absorbance uh, ability, which allows the uh, which allows their urine to go to the bottom, then only the absorption happens. So that will keep the top of the bedding dry for animal comfort. Definitely we provide these kind of things. If let's say for example, for nude mice where uh, they have lack of fur, they are very sensitive towards dust. Maybe people will provide paperlet, uh, something a bedding that is specific for nude mice is also known as a clean nesting. But how about their psychological needs. It, do we need to take care of their psychological needs? That's the focus of today. We take a good examples. Uh, during, uh, during lockdown, we are forced to actually uh, do a quarantine. So not, not say do a quarantine, we are forced to actually lock down and stay at home. And in some occasion, if we met uh, close contact, we have to quarantine ourselves. We do not feel well. So in some occasion, uh, people have to take care, intentionally take care of their uh, mental wellness or mental health. That become a great issues. So for laboratory animals, uh, since they are actually housed in a bare environment, do we also have to take care of their psycholog psychological needs? Yes, we do. And why is it so important also as as a standpoint for researchers to take care of the psychological needs. Because in some occasion, the psychological can affect physiologicals. Let's say, assume that we take a good example. Uh, if we have a rat or a mice, okay, where we give them constant small electrical shock to agitate them, to create some fear, or to create some certain degree of stress in a daily basis, what would you think about their blood biomarker, say cortisol or maybe glucose? Perhaps it might be a little bit different. So therefore, psychological needs, although uh, is not as prominent or as obvious as physiological needs, is also something that deemed to be taken care of. That's why we have to implement enrichment programs uh, for our animals. So we need, to re we need to bring in something to return back their basic life needs, the needs to control over their life, the needs to control over their environment, as well as their mates around. So rats itself is a social animal. Uh, they like to interact with each other. You seldom see rats like tiger, for example, they have their own territorial, uh, although rat has territorial uh, basis as well, but they are generally social animals. So a few considerations in selecting enrichment uh, materials. If you are putting in something into the cage for the animals to play, let's say, to spend their life on. So what is the consideration? The first, it must be safe. It cannot have sharp edges. If it is made of plastic, you can do a drop test. The drop test can be from the table down. So to ensure that it doesn't break because animals will know. So you have to maybe uh, brush the edges with your hand and check if there's any sharp edges. If no, then it will be safe. Second, it must not interfere in your experiment. So take it for example, if you are studying something, you would not want any interference in your experiment. Otherwise, uh, it's gonna be worse because you are not going to get your hypothetical question answered. Third, it must be relevant to your animals. If anyone here is uh, raising cats, okay? Cats likes to play with balls, okay? So if you give them balls, if you give them wooden ball, especially, they will interact with it, they will play with it. So that's great because they are interacting with your enrichment material, your toy. But how about if I give the same uh, enrichment material to 
a rat or mice, they would think that, hey, yeah, what is this? So they probably do not recognize this or do not feel that that is relevant. Hence, you have to know what is relevant to your animals based on their behavior. Third, it must be compatible with animal handling. You do not want anything that will interrupt or interfere when you would like to handle them. We know that for wild rodent, wild mice and rat, their daily activity, they like to do burrowing. They like to go into all these small holes, dig up and stuff like that. So will it be a good idea if I put a, a, a complex maze in, in our cage? Maybe not, because that will interfere in our handling. And last but not least, what is the material of the enrichment? It is best for us to know the, uh, the material of the enrichment to ensure the safety of the animals. So we look at some of the abnormal behaviors of mice and rats, okay? This one is specifically for mice, okay? So what if our animal is stressed? How do we recognize if they are stressed, they are in dire stress? So there are a few abnormal behavior that you need to take care of because if all this, either one of these happening, you know that daily, you know that you either have to isolate them and then yeah, uh, perform some uh, enrichment program and stuff like that. So first one is aggression. Aggressions means fighting against each other. So they can fight against each other if they are housed too dense or the room temperature is too high. So generally speaking, there is a standard guideline for uh, maintaining animals. Let's say in a standard mice cage, it's probably between three to five. Okay, sometimes a little bit more, depend on the size of the animals. For rat, perhaps two to three. So if you pack too many of them together, it's just like putting too much people inside a leaf. You probably wouldn't feel comfortable and would like to escape from the environment. That's where aggressions come in. If too high of the temperature, it will also promote fightings. Infanticide, infanticide is the practice or an actions of killing their own pups, their own kids. It's also a kind of stress. It's not normal as well. It, it will be uh, prominent if we house cap wild rodent, but for lab, uh, laboratory animals, we uh, shouldn't have too high of incidence of infanticides. Food grinding. Food grinding is an action where they grind the food, okay, without eating them. Sort of like food wasting. Yeah. So food wasting is also part of the actions uh, that shows that uh, the animals is uh, in a sign of stress. So we know that sometimes uh, uh, mice and rat, they will grind. They have the practices of grinding because uh, they are more la. Their tea is in constant growing mode. It's unlike human. We grow until certain strength, then we stop. That's why they have to grind on something. But persistent food food, food grinding might uh, be a prominent sign as well. Barbering. Barbering is an action of compulsive hair pulling. So if you look at these uh, particular uh, images, uh, see the surrounding of the eyes. They are all bare. Uh, they are all bare. These are the signs of uh, hair pulling signs. So hair pulling sign is uh, an abnormal behavior as well. So to avoid that, that's why we have to design our own enrichment programs for our colonies. And before we do that, we have to understand from the basic what are their behavior? Because enrichment program is a program that we would, we would like to return back the life of rodents, back to them. So the closer their life to their uh, natural ancestry, the better it is. So let's look back at the natural history of mouse. Mouse is a small animals. Uh, they follow human track. So whenever human goes, you will see mouse around. So they are all around now. So naturally, they are small animals. Their behavior is they tend to avoid predators. Small animal like mouse, they do not like to walk on open field. So uh, you will seldom see uh, 
mouse, wild rodent or wild mouse walking at a public walkway. They most of the time will go along the edges uh, and send it with their muscle. So yeah, uh, that is actually part of their behavior as well. How about their sense of smell? They have very strong sense of smell. They are very sensitive to their sense of smell. Their vision, their vision is perhaps poor. Their vision acuity is around 2%, perhaps very, very poor, much poorer than human. And for small animals, they like to burrow. They like to burrow. They like to burrow themselves as well as create a nest, like the picture here. So that's their natural behavior. This is a place where they call house, and this is a place where they kept themselves warm and they regulate themselves. Yeah, but how about lab mice? Are they given similar situation for them to express similar behavior? So for, to house the animals, uh, first thing, we would like to actually bring them into a situation. We would like to bring them into a situation where they can actually live like normal wild rodents, okay? And one of it would be group housings. Okay, as I mentioned just now, for rodents like mice and rat, they are naturally social animals. They like to interact, just like us, like to make friends around, meeting new people. That's why group housing is one of the best enrichment programs that you can actually provide to them. You group house them so that they have the social support there. So, you need to, uh, if your experiment can allow group housing, you should and will be encouraged to perform group housings and do respective taggings, be it with ink or with ear tag. And if we would like to actually manage their behavior and return back some of the controls, we can actually put in some of these materials inside the cage so that you can return some of the activity inside there. For example, like nesting material, like cricket papers, wood wool, or compressed cotton square. These are commercial products that you can actually put in so that they can perform their own nesting. So in WOW, rod rodents, they will do foraging. So what is foraging activity? Foraging is an activity where the rodents will go to the WOW, they collect uh, materials that they, they like, and then they bring back to the nest and they create their own nice nest. So if we put all this, this kind of material into a cages, you will start to notice that they are very, very clever. They will start to organize their cage in a way that one side of the cage will have all this crickle paper all put together very nicely as a nest. Another one perhaps is their playing ground. So if all this is not available, you can also put in tissue papers. Tissue paper is also some very, very good enrichment. So you can just get tissue paper and then wrap them, put a few of them into the cages. The next day, you will start to see that they already start to interact with the tissue papers and start to create their own nest. This creates an environment which can return uh, controls over life and bring them certain activities that they need. So if we would like to make things a little bit better, you can also put those items into a foraging box. So that, just like the image, will increase the difficulty for them to take out the material. So that would also increase the chances of them to interact with their environment as well. So all this can bring back uh, ro wild rodents behavior back to them. So of course, some may say that, nah, yeah, I might need or I might like something better or something much easier, then you can choose to have alpha trees where alpha trees is actually a kind of uh, papers enrichment which they are compressed together. So all you have to do is put, to put one scoop over there and one bag perhaps can cover for 1,400 cages change and they are all low dust content. So we have a look on a general idea, 
how does mice and rats interact with their environment if you put in enrichment? So as you can see just now, for the animals, they will interact with uh, the nesting materials that you put in, and then they will start to arrange uh, those nesting materials in one side to create the nest uh, for themselves. So a part of that, in some occasion, uh, you can also put in some grounding material. So for the mola of the animals, the front teeth, they are going to be in constant growing mode. So they will need something to grind on. You can actually put in some aspen chill stick, which is a uh, wood base or nylon chill stick. If you would like to avoid any uh, possibilities of EPA or any kind of uh, uh, materials that can interfere. So shelters and tubes, they are also something that you can actually put in. So shelter and tubes, they are naturally like uh, an, a nesting. So you can actually put in that. Uh, to actually uh, help them to create some tunnels as well as uh, uh, a shelter place for themselves. But try to avoid this if you have a big, big crowd, let's say, for example, five or maybe more, because uh, shelters can be an ambush point where we know that these are resources, something like uh, resources in our societies, people are going to grab it or maybe fight for it. So if you have big crowd, then perhaps you might, might consider uh, nesting material compared to uh, shelters. Yeah, so shelters like this, you need to select or create your own shelters that is hard, durable, and chemical resistant. Of course, creativity rules. Uh, not necessary that all these enrichment programs, we have to actually implement it uh, with the help of others we can actually create our own enrichment as well. So these are some of the projects that we, uh, we need to credit to La Femme, our Prof. Reliance groups, where uh, in their research, uh, they try to study if they can use some general items that we can find in a day-to-day -day basis and see if we can actually put inside a cage in a safe manner uh, to enrich. Uh, the life of these animals. So you can see that all these uh, shelters, tubes that is uh, created with recycled materials. And they start to put it in and we can start to see that the animals is interacting with it. You can see that uh, the animals is playing, hiding, as well as uh, interacting uh, or means it 
to create their own nest. So all this can be done with a little bit gift, gifts of creativities. So to end my talks uh, today, I would like to also uh, resound and express animal, happy animals is healthy animals. Yeah. So with that, I would like to also thank you uh, for the opportunities for uh, given by FST as well as the Animal House for me to share uh, my piece of thoughts on it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Raymond, for your talk just now. We hope that all the participants uh, obtain useful information for their work in research. Actually, we have time for question and answer now. At the moment, there's still no question in the chat box. If you have any question, you can unmute, unmute yourself and ask directly to Dr. Raymond. Anyone? Question in the chat box, uh, Dr. Raymond. The question yes, yes. from Nurul Alina. And the question is, what's the difference between inbred and outbred, is it? Yes, yes. So the difference between inbred and outbred is the, uh, the way that we breed the animal. So out, uh, outbred animal is uh, bred in a way that uh, when we are doing breeding, we are getting, uh, we best is we are getting the same strain, uh, both not related animal to breed. So that ultimately for outbred animal, they are going to, their genetic content is going to be as diverse as possible. So outbred uh, model is ideal. Let's say, for example, uh, you would like to use the animals to represent overall population, just like human, I mean, general population. Inbred model, uh, on the other hand, uh, the breeding is going to get uh, the animal with close relationship and breed them together. So as a result, their genetic content is going to be more and more focused and more and more similar. So if you are working on a model where you need very high similar, high similarity in your genetic, uh, genetic background or genetic content for your animal as a starting material, then inbred is, uh, is the one that you should go for. Let's say, for example, a very famous one would be Babsi. Yeah, Babsi is an inbred model. Okay, thank you, Dr. Raymond. I think we have another question in the chat box from iPhone. The question is, how do you structure your holding room for the 24-hour circadian rhythm of the animals? Uh, holding room. Okay, meaning that for in, in, in our animal, in our animal house, most of the animal house, I would say, they will have uh, 12 hours light and uh, 12 hours uh, night cycle. So meaning that uh, they will have 12, 12 hours of light on, another 12 hours of light off cycle in most of the time. Does that answer the question? Uh, I'm sorry, I couldn't read the name of the participant because it shows here iPhone. Uh, if it's okay, we can move on to the next question, Dr. Raymond. Yes, yes. Which is from Shahira. Yes. Will yes. different types of enrichment affect the study, especially if we conduct experiments related to testing the effect of compound on learning and memory? Mm, yeah. So if learning and memory is concerned, uh, I think it is best that you stick to one type of enrichment. Uh, because, uh, yes, uh, let's say, for example, uh, for learning memory, I, I, for learning, I think it will affect. Uh, I think it will affect. Uh, if, let's say, for example, if you, if you started with, uh, let's say, tissue papers and uh, tunnels, your self-made tunnels and stuff like that, you stick with that. You, you should stick with that, uh, ideally. Uh, yeah. So because, you, uh, as I mentioned, uh, enrichment program you design, you don't want to have any interference in your experiment. So if you think that that will interfere, then uh, you better don't know because 
um, yeah, it's best to keep things constant. Uh. Mm. Okay. Uh, I think we have uh, one more question in the chat box from yes, yes. NI Amira. The question is, which mice is suitable to induce diabetes? Oh, okay. So uh, I saw most of the group is using SD spectory rat for uh, uh, diabetes, diabetes work. Yeah, so I see occasionally la, not much uh, of using ICR mice, but uh, because let's say, for example, if you are talking about uh, induced diabetes, I presume that yeah, you are you going to use streptosotoxin uh, to do the induction. So you're going to jab streptosotoxin in, and then the streptosotoxin is going to kind of like uh, affect the pancreas cell and yeah, create an environment for diabetic. Yeah, so uh, that event is going to create some shock to the animals la, and bigger animals tend to actually survive better. La. So uh, I see most of the group using SD uh, with good success rate, la, I would say. I mean, this is from my experience from the field. Can we talk about that? Okay, so uh, we move on to the next question from Alia Najiha. The question is, yes, yes. if the food intake is concerned in the experiment, will the knowing material affect the experiment? Oh, uh, from my understanding, grounding material is not supposed to be eaten. Uh. They are not supposed to be eaten. So theoretically, it doesn't affect the food intake. Uh. Maybe... Uh, Theoretically, it doesn't affect the food intake because you are not taking the, the grounding material as a food. The, ground, the grounding material is going to be very, very strong material where, where they do not consume it. No? They don't consume it. No? But if you consider, let's say, for example, they ground and then they, they just uh, satisfy, satisfy their satiety with the ground. Mm. I don't think so. I don't think so. I, in my opinion, I do not think it will affect the food intake. Ah. I do not think. Mm. Okay, Dr. Raymond, I think there is a one last question uh, from HUKM. The yes, yes. question is, what we need to do lab mice after experiment done? Maybe after the experiment is finished, completed, what should they do with the lab mice? Is that the question? Oh, okay. So let's say, for example, uh, if once we are done with lab mice, okay, I assume that the, the question sounds like this, where we are done with the experiment. So uh, the, terminal of the, the terminal of the experiment is organ extraction, blood collection, and finally, you euthanize the animal meaning that uh, you give the animal uh, uh, a good way to die. So once they exit the trial, then uh, these animals uh, should be, the carcass should be kept. So let's say at the last day of the experiment, most of the time after our organ collection and stuff like that, uh, we will pack the animals. Uh, and then after that, we will frozen it first of all. So, uh, then after that, we will prepare them for incineration, uh, means uh, uh, proper disposal and stuff like that. Yeah, so I, I presume that this is, uh, this is the question. Um, yep. Okay, uh, Dr. Raymond, uh, I think we have one more question. <laughs> There's a lot of questions at the uh, moment. Yes, yes, uh, no one problem. more question yeah. from iPhone, which is Oluwa yes. Dawunsi Kebenga. Yes, uh, yes. The question is, is, is there, there a specific strain of rat or mice for dementia, Alzheimer's disease research? Uh, I can, I never handle one before. Uh, I mean, uh, but I can talk uh, from the experience from the field because uh, we are working with several groups. Uh, uh, there are models for, there are model for Alzheimer's. Uh, you can actually induce Alzheimer's. Uh, from my understanding, you can actually induce Alzheimer by uh, putting certain material. I believe it's aluminium, aluminium, or stuff like that. Yeah. So that will induce uh, the aging 
or degeneration in the brain. Yeah, so that's one model. Uh, means you have to perform some surgeries on, on, on those. Yeah, let's say like SD, right? Another, another way is to get specific models, but those models are, we can bring in, but you have to import from somewhere where uh, they are genetically modified, that they, they are going to have degeneration in a faster rate. Yeah, because chances is you don't really want to wait <laughs> for maybe uh, one and a half year or two years for natural aging to happen. Uh. Okay, uh, I hope Dr. Raymond has answered the question. Uh, we have one more question, Dr. Raymond, from Chi Wai. Yes, yes. The question is, he would like to ask, is there any best model for primary cell culture? Primary cell, is there any best model for primary cell culture? Mm, do you mean injecting primary cell culture into the animals and then uh, the best model of animals that can accept this kind of uh, primary cell culture? Chi uh, if you can unmute yourself, maybe you can ask directly for uh, hi. better clarification. Uh, Dr. Ryong, can you repeat your question again? I, I yeah. cannot hear you this time. Yes, yes. Chi uh, do you mean uh, a proper model for you to inject or in administer your uh, primary primary cell into uh, the to mice? To extract the, the mice organ for primary cell culture, like the... Uh, uh, which, which organ for, for the neuron cells or even the um, spleen cells, yeah. Oh, I see where you're coming from. Meaning that uh, you would like to get, let's say, splenocyte or brain, brain cell. You would like to isolate those from animals. Uh, which animals is suitable model, is it? Uh, uh, yes. Oh, okay. Actually, if uh, done properly, uh, any model, you can actually do that. Let's say, for example, uh, for spinocyte, hepatocyte, I, I, uh, I come across a few research groups that use mice. Yeah. So for brain, I come across groups that use rat. So I, I think all the animal model, if you would like to get their primary cell out, should not should be okay yeah you just have to find the proper region and the proper method to process that let's say for example you want to get spleen outside you have to do a proper spin and then use something to isolate them out yeah okay thank you welcome okay so there's another question in the chat box from Nurul shifa the yes, question yes. is uh, hi dr raymond is there any proper method to administer capsule which contain toxic material to rat without harming them? Mm, mm, yeah, good question. Uh, but I do not have experience in that. So I can't advise too much. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I, I, I never administered capsule straight before. Yeah, so take out the capsule and then uh, dissolve them and then oral, oral feed them. Yes, yeah. So, but uh, putting the whole the whole capsule in, mm, not sure if it's doable because uh, some capsule, they are perhaps edibles for human. I mean, it depends on capsule. If let's say, for example, it's those uh, albumin capsule, you can take, take out and then the active ingredients inside there. You can actually oral garage that. I'm not sure if that's applicable. Lah. If those capsule that's, let's say, like for example, vitamin C, heart capsule, you can crush them perhaps. You can crush them and then oral feed them. Would it be better? Rather than you put the whole capsule in, they, they are going to start in the middle. Yeah, so. Okay, so we move on to the next question from one of our participants, Shahida. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, she said, hi, I am Shah from Pohang University of Science and Technology, Korea. There are two questions. The first one, yes, yes. can you suggest or explain, especially animal diet or nutrition, that can boost animal productivity for in vivo testing. Uh, you would like in to respond test. to that one first? Okay, so I try to answer that. <laughs> I try to answer that. Let me suggest an explanation of animal diet or nutrition that can boost animal productivity. So when we talk about animal productivity, uh, what do we mean? Meaning that uh, 
you would like to, I mean, what, what I understand animal productivity is that you are doing breeding. Are you doing breeding? So you would like to actually increase the breeding efficiency. So, yeah. Another one is... Another one, is there any specific rat or mice suitable, suitable for soil, soil contamination, contamination research? research. Hmm. Second one is definitely outside my scope. <laughs> I try to answer the first one. So, uh, for uh, nutrition that is uh, suitable for breeding. So, uh, if you look at commercials, uh, commercials diet, uh, there is one variant of diet known as, uh, that is specific for breeding. They are higher content in protein. They have high, a bit higher content in uh, protein. So if you would like to, in terms of nutrition wise, if you would like to increase the productivity, you can actually opt for that kind of, uh, that kind of diet. Okay, so this is one thing. Uh, second thing, I think uh, for breeding wise, uh, also depends whether it's okay, it depends oh it depends on uh inbred outbred now. so let's say for example for inbred uh naturally you will meet a situation where your colony is going to shrink <laughs> because uh the more genetically similar they are that when you try to breed them uh the lesser offspring they have uh. that's why for example like icr mice like uh outbred mice you will get maybe six six to eight or perhaps maximum i don't know 10 uh 10 offspring out, out of a single breed uh from a single mother so something like that and most of them sort of like survive that's outbred so if you maintain the outbreadness you are going to do well uh inbred on the other hand you gotta solve it from the top oh, meaning that uh you have to really take care of your uh future breeding stock F, uh fvs so if you take care of your future breeding stock and then those future breeding stock uh, uh, is as high, the, the generation is as high as possible, uh, then you, you should do well. Uh, you should do well. Yeah. So, uh, but of all, uh, at certain interval of time, you have to change your field. You, you have to change your stock eventually. Uh, that's, to, that's for breeding purposes. So is there any more question from the participant? You can also unmute yourself and directly ask uh, Dr. Raymond if you have any questions. I think since uh, there are no more questions, uh, we'll move on to photo session. Will that be okay, Dr. Raymond? Yes, yes, definitely. Okay, sure. So uh, to all participants who have uh, camera access, maybe you can switch on your camera for a photo session. So we have about 150 plus participants today, Dr. Raymond. Wow. That's encouraging. Thanks a lot uh, for this opportunity to uh, share some of the thoughts. Thank you very much. Don't be shy. Turn on your camera. <laughs> we have uh, 150 plus participants. But I think only the first page is full with uh, pictures, but the others are still blank. <laughs> Okay, technical, are we ready for a uh, photo session? Okay, on the count of three, three, two, one, smile. Okay, technical uh, committee said they are done with the photo session. Thank you everyone for your time. Um, the link for attendance also has been shared in the chat box, uh, please, uh, Click the link and complete the form. So once again, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Raymond and Prima Nexus for sharing your knowledge and your time. And uh, to the participants, we thank you for your time attending this uh, webinar. We hope it's useful to all of you. And with this, we hope uh, you have a nice day ahead of you. So thank you very much and have a good day, everyone. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you, Dr. Raymond. Bye. Bye. -bye.